Children are excused. For the rest of us, well, let's open our Bibles. I uh, kind of really love those words. I, I would suggest to you if you're ever looking for a church, hope you won't be, but if you are and no one standing up in front here uses those words, open your Bible, you might want to look for another church. Paul's epistle to the Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, and we'll be looking this evening at verses 6 through 8. We live in a season where we see all around us a great falling away, falling away from the ways and commandments of the Lord, a time when many, even many within the church, are in a state of rebellion against God. Our culture has promoted the false and harmful attitude that God's commandments are restrictive and oppressive. Our flesh and the devil himself applaud this false notion. As believers, however, we must understand that our Heavenly Father's commandments are for our own good. They train us in righteousness and protect us from wandering into sin. Contrary to the secular view that God's law hinders happiness, obedience to him is actually the source of great pleasure and peace and joy. We will look this evening at the Apostle Paul's admonition concerning rebellion, again in Galatians 6, verses 6 through 8. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you, we seek your word, for you tell us that it is living and powerful. You tell us that in it is all wisdom and knowledge and understanding. You tell us that in it is the strength that we might have, that we might follow you every day by turning from our own flesh, by picking up our crosses and being able to follow you in Jesus' name. Amen. Galatians chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Galatians 6, 6 through 8. Galatians 6. Six through eight. <laughs> uh, if you don't know why that's funny, see my wife after church. <laughs> Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Amen. To regard sharing in all good things with him who teaches as a waste is to mock God. It is selfishness that mocks God's generosity towards those who give to him. Martin Luther put it strongly, be careful, you scoffers. God may postpone his punishment for a time, but he will find you out in time and punish you for despising his servants. You cannot laugh at God. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For those who are hesitant to share in all good things 
with those who teach them, Paul reminded them of God's principle of sowing and reaping. Their giving to share in all good things isn't like throwing away money. It's like planting seeds and whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. As we sow the seeds of rebellion and disobedience to God's work, we will find God's response costly. In fact, the harsh truth is that we don't merely reap what we sow, but often reap more than we sow and later than we sow. Matthew Henry wrote, God who is perfectly acquainted with their hearts as well as actions, and as he cannot be deceived, so he will not be mocked. And therefore, to prevent this, he directs us to lay down as a rule to ourselves that whatever soever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Or that according as we behave ourselves now, so will our account be in the great day. Our present time is seed time. In, other, in the other world, there will be a great harvest. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. If we want to reap to the Spirit, we should not hesitate to sow to the Spirit with whatever resources God has given us. Warren Wiersbe wrote, but God has also told us to be careful where we sow. And it is this principle that Paul dealt with here. He looked on our material possessions as seed, and he sees two possible kinds of soil, the flesh and the spirit. We can use our material goods to promote the flesh or to promote the things of the spirit. But once we have finished sowing, we cannot change the harvest. Menno Kalischer uh, was the pastor of Jerusalem Assembly in, of all places, Jerusalem, wrote, but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Whoever dedicates himself to the things Paul means by sowing to the spirit, the study of the word of God, spreading the gospel and helping others, whoever does so out of faith in Jesus and well leaning on the grace of God is sowing to the field of God. Unlike the fruit of the flesh, the fruit of God promises to supply all the needs of today and will be plentiful in eternity. The believers who sow to the Spirit will live forever in the kingdom of God. They will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. There is an additional meaning here. He who sows to the Spirit by spreading the gospel, whether he preaches himself or supports others who do so, will see the salvation of souls. They will inherit everlasting life together with him. A farmer reaps the same as he has sown. If he plants wheat, wheat comes up. If we sow to the flesh, the flesh will increase in size and strength. The farmer reaps the same as he has sown, but not exactly. The apple seed doesn't just grow more apple seeds, but more apples 
with seeds. Even so, when we sow to the Spirit, even with material things, what we reap is not necessarily material things, but something better of the Spirit, we reap everlasting life. The farmer also reaps more if he sows more. And the relationship between what he sows and what he reaps is exponential. A farmer can plant one apple seed and receive hundreds of apples over time. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. This principle has application beyond giving and supporting teachers and ministers. It has a general application in life. What we get out of life is often what we put into it. Yet Paul is not promoting some law of spiritual karma that ensures we will get good when we do good or always get bad when we do bad. If there were such an absolute law, it would surely damn us all. Instead, Paul simply relates the principle of sowing and reaping to the way we manage our God-given resources of time <coughs> and treasure before the Lord and how we live in obedience to our Lord's commands. The apostle used the same picture in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 10. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. We may fool ourselves by expecting much when we sow little, but we cannot fool God, and the results of our poor sowing will be evident. What we do reap when we give and obey, we may reap blessings that are material, but vastly more important we will be reaping spiritual blessings, both while we are here on earth and eternally in heaven. John Calvin wrote, this harvest should be understood both in terms of the spiritual reward of eternal life and also referring to the earthly blessings with which God honors the beneficent. The best of these earthly blessings include joy and a peace that passes all understanding. I can recall my first experience in Christian service was with the Billy Graham Evangelical Association. And it was, I was still working for a living. Uh, I would work Saturdays, often 10 hours, our broadcasts started at about five and we were to be uh, at the center about four. So I would go in very early on Saturday and work. And this being my sixth day of work, I would be very, very tired when I got in at four. But then, as the broadcast started around the country at five and the phones started ringing with people wanting to talk about God, with people feeling they had some emptiness in their hearts and looking for a way to fill it, the time just flew by. And by 10 or 11, when I got home, I didn't feel exhausted. I felt energized. Because when you're serving the Lord, when the Holy Spirit who dwells within you is guiding you and leading you, you experience these spiritual joys 
and the peace that passes all understanding just blots out your exhaustion, your tiredness. What Jesus promised is quoted in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So knowing that serving God with our treasure, our time, our gifts, and our obedience will yield us an eternal, joyful relationship with Almighty God, why do we continue to struggle with a flesh which desires the momentary, transitory pleasures of disobedience and the momentary, transitory pleasures of rebellion and the momentary, transitory pleasures of sin? It is because that our flesh is sinful and we exist in a sinful world our flesh can feel fatigued, insecure, inadequate, and worthless. Satan can and will use these feelings to distract us from God's purpose for us. If we let him, Satan will lead us into transgression, even into a continuing pattern of wrongdoing and into a captivity to sin and rebellion. Listen to what James says wrote in James 1, verses 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire conceives, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Charles Spurgeon wrote, Satan tempts, God tries. But the same trial may be both a temptation and a trial, and it may be a trial from God's side and a temptation from Satan's side. Just as Job suffered from Satan, and it was a temptation, but he also suffered from God through Satan, and so it was just a trial to him. John Calvin said, Scripture asserts that the reprobate are delivered up to depraved lusts. But, it, but is it because the Lord depraves or corrupts their hearts? <coughs> By no means, for their hearts are subjected to depraved lusts because their hearts are already corrupt and vicious. When we fall into a pattern of recurring sin, of rebellion brought forth by the devil or by our own corrupt flesh, or both, how can we break free? Break free by turning to our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who offers absolution from sin through his selfless sacrifice on the cross. Confess. Repent and remember that as the Apostle Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long suffering for us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And listen as Ezekiel wrote in Ezekiel 33, 11, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his way and live. To confess and repent, we must recognize our enslavement to sin. It's possible that blind spots prevent your seeing a sin that is obvious to others 
Accountability to a trusted friend or loved one may be appropriate. To confess and repent, we must trace this sin to its root. What purpose does our sin serve? Is it a way to avoid responsibility? Is it a way to cloud transparency? Is it a way to briefly blot out any discomfort we might have? And then, because we have free will, we must choose to be free. By Jesus' death and resurrection, we are offered the greatest possible freedom. That freedom is reconciliation to God. Some people find liberation quickly, while others embark on a slow journey toward freedom. But one thing is clear for everyone. The Lord can break the enslavement of sin and insecurity in our lives if we but ask his help and walk toward restoration. And as we are turning from our sin and rebellion, we must never forget that God is the source of all our comfort. What comfort we can derive from dwelling in his divine attributes. Remember that our God is omnipresent. He is everywhere, always at the same time. Psalm 139 verses 7 through 10 describes this beautifully. It sings, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Even when you feel isolated and friendless, you are not alone. For as you trust in God, he is always with you and in you. God's understanding is infinite. He knows everything, even our feelings and our needs. If we will but turn to him and turn away from our sin and rebellion, he will give us all the strength and guidance we will ever need. And we may take comfort in the immutable fact that God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In him there is no variation, no shadow of turning. The prophet Malachi quotes the Lord God in Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 and 7. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you. What a promise. James said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He tells us to humble ourselves before the Lord God. And if we do, God promises to lift us up. As the Lord promised the children of Israel that if they would return to him, he would return to them. So as we return to God, turning from our sins and rebellion, he will, through the finished work of Jesus Christ, receive us into his outstretched and loving arms. Please, let's pray together. Oh Lord, we come and humble ourselves before you. We so look forward 
to you lifting us up. Lord, we are in awe of the fact that you treat us not only as your servants, using us to do work that you so could do better, but allowing us the joy of serving you. But you also call us your children. And what comfort we have in the arms of our Heavenly Father. What comfort we have as the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and righteousness and justice. And what wonderful, what wonderful comfort and peace we have in the knowledge that Jesus is in us. For Lord Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen.